Welcome back to our program, Hollywood Structured. As some of you already know, our program is designed to help the young people who wish to enter the entertainment field, may it be in nightclub work, theater, film, or television. It is also designed to help the parents and the educators of those young people to help them understand their wants and their needs and the pitfalls and the trap they may fall into unless thoroughly acquainted with the inner workings of Hollywood. As our special guest, we have another member of the film industry, but in another branch. Someone who started as a child actor at the age of eight or 10, I believe, who later on became a theatrical director and later on became an agent. An agent, someone who can get you a job, someone whom you may hate, someone whom you may love, someone who can become a friend for the rest of your life, sometimes. And usually, it depends only upon you. His name is David Sachs. Hello, David. Hello, Lillian. Thank you for having me here this morning. That's fine. Before David shares his experiences with us, I would like to speak today about fear. And since I'm not a psychologist or an analyst or a psychiatrist, I will only speak about fear as it relates to our industry. You may be fearful, and you may not even know about it. We are creative people. Therefore, we put ourselves on the line every time we open our mouth. Sometimes we open it too often and too much. Now, in any other profession, there is a product. Let's say that you are a shoe salesman. Well, you're selling shoes, the product is the shoe. Someone comes into your store, you offer them 10 pair of shoes, and they don't like them. The color is wrong, the height is wrong, whatever. Now, what is being rejected is the shoe, not you, the salesperson. However, in our industry, since you're trying to sell yourself, you become the product the emotional part of you, the intellectual part of you, the physical part of you, is the product. And if that product is rejected a few times, you then become fearful. Now, fear in our industry, when you first start as an actor, can be very detrimental to you. It will make you do poor training and subsequently, poor work. Now, your fear of not being as good as you think you are, or thinking that you are better than you are, can be very destructive. It will do two things for you. First, fear will paralyze you to the point where your progress will stop. Your growth will stand still. Second, you will become the best critic in the world. I mean, for example, your drama coach is stupid. Your drama coach doesn't understand you, uh, doesn't realize how good you are, pays more attention to another student than to you. Casting directors are stupid. I mean, they are not capable to see how good you look or how good you are. I mean, writers are stupid. I mean, that last scene that you had to audition with was bad. I mean, you could write a better dialogue than that. No, your agent is not good. I mean, it hasn't gotten you out in about two weeks or three weeks. Therefore, let's switch agent. I mean, that's as simple as that. You see, you are so busy criticizing and tearing apart everything and everyone around you that there is no way you will make it in our industry. There is no way you will be a respected member of the film industry. And all because of your fear. Fear of succeeding, fear of losing and failing. You see, we know fear. Fear is very secure. You suffer, that's secure, you know about it. Joy, you don't know. Succeeding, you don't know. So you sort of shy away from it, and you cultivate fear. I know it's very easy for me to say, let go of it. Take one day at a time. Learn one thing 
a day. Maybe, maybe just one word. Observe other people. Remember that in the industry, preparation, perseverance, patience, and more preparation is everything. <clears throat> Train yourself without comparing yourself to other people. Accept that work and success will not happen overnight. Accept that other doors will be open for you in other profession of the industry, like those 30 professions that we have already talked about in our programs. Who knows? Maybe someday one of you might become an agent, like David. <laughs> well, let's find out now how one becomes an agent, what does an agent do, and what is required of an agent. David, I have a few questions for you. First of all, where were you, were you born in California? No, Cleveland, Ohio, long time ago. I see. And when, did you have any idea you would ever become an agent? Never. 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 <laughs> never all right. Now, I didn't know what an agent was. I see. No. All right. When you were in Cleveland and with your family, did they want you to be in the movie industry? What did they want you to become? Well, like all good Jewish families in Cleveland, either a doctor or a lawyer, uh, something with uh, dignity. Uh, they probably hoped that uh, my love of acting was a passing fancy that I would go into something more secure. Uh, they didn't oppose it, but they didn't give much encouragement either. Now, how did you start being a child actor at eight years old? Well, especially in Cleveland. My brother was four years older, is four years older than I am, and he started at the Cleveland Playhouse and was quite successful. And I think there's a tendency for younger brothers and sisters to imitate their older brothers, especially if they're in a glamour, quote, uh, part of the, uh, the business. So I started going to classes when I was young and uh, started in a couple of shows in Cleveland so that, uh, I don't know, somebody said that theater is like an infection and once you're stung, you never get it out of your system. And that's, I guess, what happened to me. So I um, worked in Cleveland until I was 13, uh, then moved to California with my family. The war was just starting in Europe and uh, I went to high school in Alameda and I quit my second year because my family was falling apart, my parents were divorcing, and I decided at the age of 16 I wanted to pursue theater seriously. So I started to apprentice uh, in San Francisco with an opera company. I worked there for a couple of years. Why the opera? Uh, I was exposed to music when I was very young, living in Cleveland as a wonderful orchestra, and I started going to symphony concerts, and uh, I just love opera because uh, it's... Um, it's the ultimate expression of theater in a way because uh, it's a culmination of music, uh, acting, uh, scenery, lights, makeup. It's make-believe. If, if you can love opera, it, you have to be very willfully emotional. Bernard Shaw said that he learned how to write plays by going to operas and studying the plots. So it was kind of a fascination, a strange one for a 17-year-old. But that led me back into theater. Now, you said you were drafted. And uh, there is no, there is no theater in the army, as far as I right. know. There, there, there wasn't at Fort Ord. There were special services, but there were just variety shows. And because the, the time I went in the army, uh, there are a lot of uh, uh, rising young stars. Daryl Hickman, uh, Bing Crosby, Gary Crosby was there. A lot of very talented people who had stage experience. So we kind of all decided that uh, variety shows were okay, but they weren't enough. We wanted to so to pursue our, our, our art and our destiny. We formed a theater company, and I did about seven shows in the 22 months I was in the Army. Now, were you an actor or were you a director? Uh, director primarily, but I, I had to be in all the shows because there weren't enough actor, actors, real actors, to go yes. around. And that's very difficult. I think it's very hard to direct and be in a show. And I would rather not, but on a lot of occasions we have no choice, especially in summer stock, where you're only allowed so many equity actors, so many union actors per show, and if, they, uh, if the budget is bad, the, act the director is pushed on at the last minute, and so he has to be a member of the guild and all those things. So that's how that happened. Okay, so now you're out of the army, mm -hmm. and what do you do? How do you switch from being an actor to become a theatrical director? Well, uh, I think you have to feel that it's a calling. It's something that you want to do more than anything else in the world. Like, all things are worthwhile. It has to be your 
a feeling of destiny about it. I, I really want to do this more than anything, and I'm going to work at it until, uh, until I find out that it, it isn't possible. So after the Army, I uh, went back to San Francisco, and I started working with various theater groups there uh, as an actor, and then they let me direct my first show, uh, which was fortunately very successful. And uh, the second show was even more successful than the first, and a uh, few people came out from New York to see it, and uh, I got wonderful reviews at that moment. I should have probably left for New York, but I was in love with San Francisco. I was, you know, in my late 20s, and here all the hippie movement was getting going. All these wonderful things were happening. I didn't want to leave San Francisco. It's a beautiful city, and, uh, you know, you can die in New York <laughs> because of the, the, the competition and the, the pace, which burns out a lot of people. Let me ask you something. You said you didn't finish school in Cleveland or in Alameda. You, you never went to college? Uh, I did. Uh, after, uh, after working uh, for about two or three years, I decided that uh, I really wanted to get some more technical uh, knowledge of my business. Uh, so I went to uh, a junior college to make up uh, high school credits and then went from there to UCLA uh, as a sophomore. And then uh, after I graduated, then I was drafted, but I did manage to get a degree. And I'm very glad I did. It was, uh, it was a very good theater school, wonderful people teaching there. Uh, they're all icons now. There's a Ralph Frude Auditorium, there's a Schnitzler Auditorium. I, I go there now and I think, my God, I must be 150 years old. I studied with all these people and now their theater is named after them. But it was a very exciting time. Carol Burnett was in my graduating class, Bert Convey, a lot of wonderful people who then I didn't see for 15 years because of the Army, then going up to San Francisco. And now, were you making a lot of money as a director in the uh, theater in San Francisco? No, unfortunately, I was having a lot of fun, but uh, directing in uh, smaller, sometimes community theater does not pay a lot. Uh, but uh, I was able to eke out a living. I, I did some set work uh, in television. I worked for the San Francisco Opera Company as a makeup artist. I did lots of different interesting things, but they were, all seemed to be related to theater. What brought and, you to uh, Los Angeles, finally? Desperation. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, it's just, uh, I think anybody uh, after 15 or 10 or 15 years gets tired of doing the same job. And I think you, uh, you get sort of uh, to a point where you feel that you need to change your venue because uh, you're getting stale. Your, your ideas aren't as creative as they were. It's, it's just another job. How many shows can you turn out? You don't have enough rehearsal time. You, you don't have the actors you really want to work with. So you said, let's try something else for a while. Now, when you came here, um, did, did you think of becoming an actor? I mean, of becoming a, an agent? Uh, what happened? The, possibly in the back of my mind. Uh, I knew at the age of 40 I didn't want to start reviving an acting career, uh, and I didn't want to direct for, for a while anyway. Did you know anybody uh, in agenting? I did. A uh, chap that I went to UCLA with who uh, had been in, in uh, languages and uh, foreign relations had been, become an agent in Europe for MCA for 17 years. His name is Robert Husong, and he opened an agency here, and I joined him as a sub-agent, not knowing anybody in the business, just starting out cold turkey, which is kind of frightening and interesting. Would you say it's very important for the young people coming out here to make friends along the way? Oh, uh, in, I think in it's the workshops most important. And, uh, Your contacts are the most important things you have. You may have the greatest talent in the world, but if nobody knows about it, it's not going to help. But somewhere along the way, you, you make friends with everybody uh, in the business, and eventually you find that the guy who's serving coffee uh, on the set, the gopher, uh, three years later is, is directing a uh, $16 million film. And he remembers you, uh, and if he respects your, your talent, uh, he'll be in a position to hire you. And that's what counts. And Carol Burnett to this day, and I love the lady, and I admire her style, as, as many years of success as she's had, the first thing she does when she comes on a set, she shakes hands with the grips, with the camera people, with the makeup people, with the wardrobe people, because not only is she an outgoing, friendly lady, but she knows they can either make or break you. And if you go in on a set and you start becoming a prima donna, uh, they can put very bad light and bad makeup and bad wardrobe, and you can be ruined. And it has nothing to do with your talent. So, contacts. Contacts are important. And respecting everybody else. And respecting everybody <coughs> else's industry, ability. Excuse me. And getting along with people the best you can. And David, also, age, uh, uh, young actors usually don't understand the work of an agent. 
they usually think that the agent is not doing their work if they don't go out on an audition. Would you describe directly to the young people, what is your work day? What do you do? Okay, a work exactly. day. And I'm sure this, uh, this may not be true of every agent, uh, the way I work. I got into the, I start, I had a, a lot of contacts in New York who are involved in theater. Uh, and because I have a lot of people working in theater beside television, motion picture, I try to, to get on the phone before they go out to lunch, which means starting to phone people in New York at 8.30, find out what the scene is there, what they're looking for. Uh, I work at home on the phone for about a half hour, uh, have a, a banana and a cup of tea, and go to the office and start looking over the breakdowns. And I have a Question. wonderful... Question. Yes. They don't know what breakdown oh. is. Would breakdowns, you please explain? Breakdowns are a wonderful invention started about 15 years uh, by a chap named Gary Marsh. And uh, he devised the, the uh, system of going to the studios, getting the scripts uh, right off the press, uh, doing a line count for each character and a description of each character, and then uh, putting them uh, out in, in mimeograph form so that when we come in the office, we don't have to read or break, uh, we don't have to do the, 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 the breaking down character by character, scene by scene of each script. It's already done for us, and it saves a tremendous amount of time. So, uh, you know, I can't read 85 scripts a week, but he can, and he has people helping him. And so that's a, it's a big aid to us uh, and a shortcut. So you so receive this every morning? Every morning. The, and then what do you do from there? Uh, we read the breakdowns, uh, we type up submissions, we send in pictures and resumes of the actors who we think are suitable for the roles that are available, and then we get on the phone and start harassing the casting department and seeing if there's any producers we know, if any directors we know. Uh, we may try and bypass the casting department if we know somebody who's directing. It's happened. I've gotten people jobs by calling a director that an actor had a very firm personal relationship and saying, hey, uh, I want you to hire Charles McCauley because you loved him and he did a pilot for you and it was very successful. And here's a part just like this. Bring him back again. It'll bring you success in this pilot. And it happens. Uh, so there, there there are a dozen different ways of trying to get actors' jobs. Uh, and, uh, let me, let me stir you back to, to okay. your day's work. All right. Now, you, you finish everything about white time. Uh, I mean, your, your well, casting it, list. It, and it, uh, it depends on the time of the year. Right now, uh, most of the shows that are going to be on in the fall uh, are being shot every day. They're doing a show week, um, both episodic, both, both the, the hour format and the half-hour sitcoms. Uh, it, uh, it depends on how many breakdowns we get per day when I'm finished. I'm really never finished because... Uh, now, do you have somebody who takes them to the studio? Do you mail them to the studio? They, they're picked up uh, by a delivery service by, at 1.30, which means the mornings are, are horrendous because uh, I, I try to ask my clients, don't call between 9.30 and 1.30 because I'm busy trying to get you jobs. And if you call and uh, interrupt my, my concentration, it's going to uh, put me uh, late in getting my, uh, my submissions out, and I may be missing something for you. Now, do so. you do, I mean, do you do legwork? Do you go to different studios and as, meet different casting directors, as, or is it just done by mail? It's both. I, I try and get to the studios as often as possible. I think the personal contact is important. Uh, but the casting directors really don't have time to uh, to have uh, personal meetings with agents. Uh, they, they, they have an idea. They've seen the script before you do. Uh, they have put out preliminary feelers for actors they think are, are right for the uh, shows that they have. Uh, if they have any doubt in their mind, uh, and if you call at a propitious moment, they say, oh, yeah, put Sachs on. He's got somebody I think would be right for so-and-so. Say, what's Larry Haddon doing next week? Is he available? Sure, he's available. Would he mind coming and reading for me before he goes to the producers? Mm -hmm. And a lot of actors uh, who are established in our business, who have been in the business for many, many years, they don't want to read for a casting director. They feel that their reputation is established. They should be able to go directly to a producer-director meeting. Mm -hmm. uh, and sometimes you have to cajole an actor, say, look, you know, uh, Joe, Joe so-and-so knows that you can do a kind of role, but this is different than you usually do. Could you, would you mind going in and proving to him that I'm right and you're right and you can do this kind of role? Because the casting director's biggest fear of bringing, is bringing an actor in who will fall on his face in front of the producers. And the producers say, 
Why do I need you as a casting director? This man can't act his way out of a paper bag. So everybody is defensive and trying to protect their own position. And David, we, yeah. let me bring you back to your day's work. Oh, now it's okay. 1.30. All your submission have, been, uh, have gone. Hopefully. What do you do? You, this is the end of your day? No, good heavens, no. No, I, I go out to lunch, hopefully, with a casting director or <laughs> with a producer or with a young starlet who wants representation. And we talk about different things. But uh, uh, I would say four days out of five, I have the, the food brought in because if the phones are ringing, and people are wanting to set up appointments, I have to be there. And if I have offers for my, for my clients, I want to be able to discuss the offers with them and try and, and, uh, and come to a conclusion on what the kind of billing, what kind of money they're going to get. Uh, How do you get paid, David? Uh, a franchise agent, uh, franchised by the state uh, uh, of California, uh, is allowed to collect 10% uh, of the gross salary. Uh, the check is sent to the office. We make out a check for 90% to the actor and 10% is ours. Now, uh, what, is, what is a franchise agent? Because well, I don't uh, think that the young people know over there. In order to operate as an agent and be able to collect anybody's salary, uh, you have to post a bond uh, with the state of California for I think it's about $12,000 now. Uh, and this is to cover any mishaps that might happen, uh, an actor doesn't get paid, he's, uh, maybe the, uh, the agent runs off to Mexico with his $50,000 <laughs> check, and so the, the, uh, the bond covers that, uh, so that it, it restricts the number of people who can become an agent. A lot of people would like to become agents, they think it's glamorous and you become a millionaire overnight and all these great things happen. Uh, it's not true. Uh, an agent has to uh, be approved by the Screen Actors Guild. Uh, in order to become an agent, he has to be sponsored by five people who are uh, in the business and are related uh, to the agency world in some manner or another. Uh, and they, uh, they, they take a long time deciding whether they're going to give anybody an agent's franchise. Uh, I work as a sub-agent, and I have with three different agents in the last 20 years. Uh, that's because I never wanted the uh, the problems of, of the real estate and the uh, the office overhead and hiring um, uh, secretaries and whatever. Uh, I've always felt more comfortable working with uh, with another agent, uh, bounce ideas off uh, the wall with one another, have uh, meetings once in a while to see what problems we can help one another with. David, let me ask you a couple of questions. Um, one is, do you, after your day's work, do you go to parties or do you go to small theater? Would you encourage the young people coming out here to continue studying or to start studying? And do you sign a lot of young people? And if yes, why? And if no, why? Okay. Uh, that's, that's a four-sided question. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Let, let's start with, what do I do the rest of the day? Uh, the rest of the day, I'm, I'm phoning the studios. I'm trying to make appointments for actors to go in. I'm suggesting ideas to casting people. Uh, if I get out of the office by 7.30, quarter of 8, I'm pretty lucky. Uh, I like to go to theater, uh, and I think it's part of my job, and I think it's part of every good agent's job to be looking for, for new talent. Uh, early in my career, so I, I go to theater two or three times a week, sometimes more often, depends on what's, what's happening. There are 45 waiver theaters in a uh, 45-mile area of Los Angeles. I can't hit them all, but if I hear that somebody is doing a wonderful job in a show and it's, it's a brilliant cast and wonderfully directed, I feel it's my obligation to try and see it. And I try and see everything downtown because uh, it's important for, for, to see all the shows that are popular. David, talk to me about the young actors. All right, I was going. That was going to be my. Because my I only next, have three minutes on the show right now. All right. Yes. There are only three. Good heavens! Yes. I do talk a lot. Uh, early in my career as a, as a uh, agent, I was a starry-eyed as a young actor, thinking uh, if you get people and you discover them and you make stars out of them, that they're going to be with you forever and you're going to make millions of dollars and become very happy together. I found that this is not the truth. Uh, young actors. Uh, naturally are very ambitious. Uh, the big agencies usually won't take them, or if they do, they're kind of buried in the, 
uh, in the back files and they don't get out much, they mm -hmm. don't get much attention because they're not making a lot of money for the agency. Uh, so they go to a small agent uh, or medium size who spends a lot of time in grooming them, uh, getting them out, trying to build them up into a star status. Uh, unfortunately, as soon as they start making good money, they decide the small agent is not good enough for them. They have to be with a big agent. Of course, the big agents are wooing them uh, and offering them all sorts of uh, wonderful things if you come and be with uh, a big agent. And so after you've done all the work, after you've laid the groundwork, after you've started the fire and everybody else is then fi uh, warming their behinds by it, you feel, why did I spill my guts for this? Because I have nothing. Uh, and they're going up to make millions, and, and they wouldn't be there if I didn't discover and do all this work so first. So what you're talking so about is lack of loyalty? A lack of loyalty. Lack of loyalty. Uh, which David, is we have two minutes, and if okay. you want to talk about loyalty, I'm giving you one minute. All right. <laughs> because I have to wrap I, up. I think that the, the best description I can give of the relationship between an agent and an actor, it's like a marriage. Uh, you have to trust one another. You're going to have fights. There are going to be moments where you, uh, the actor is insecure and the, uh, the uh, uh, agent becomes aware of it and he tries to help with this insecurity. But like uh, any marriage, the first six months is the hardest. If you can get past that and get a working pattern, uh, and if uh, something is, is right upstairs and it works, uh, it's wonderful. Uh, if it doesn't work after a certain amount of time, uh, I think that uh, it's, uh, it's a good idea to part company, uh, which makes for a lot of divorces in Hollywood. Okay. All right? David, we have to wrap up. I would like to thank David to share his expertise with us. Now remember, you people out there, keep watching us because we keep watching out for you. Thank you. Till next time.